propose, which is problem number six. So you have a unitary representation. So here it just means uh, a homomorphism of a topological group, which is locally compact and sigma compact, so that it makes sense to say that the sequence goes to infinity. And uh, H is a Hilbert space, a complex Hilbert space, and U is the group of a unitary transformation of this Hilbert space. And uh, the claim is that if this representation is mixing, so in other words, if all coefficients goes to zero uh, at infinity, then um, it means that uh, there is no finite dimensional representation. So more precisely, if you have a subspace V, let's say a closed subspace in, in H, which is invariant under all transformation by the image of uh, the homomorphism pi, then the, the, the only possibility is that uh, uh, V is, is zero. Uh, so it means in particular that you, you can't have a, a, a line which is invariant. So in other words, there is no eigenvector. It means that if you have V which is sent to a multiple of itself, then uh, this, uh, this vector has to be zero. Okay, so this is... Uh, very interesting from the point of view of representation theory. For example, it, it implies that a group which satisfies the Homo uh, uh, theorem uh, has no uh, unitary representation, which is finite dimensional, except the trivial one. So as a corollary, For example, SL2R has no non trivial finite dimensional representation, unitary, unitary representation. So it means that if you want to study the representation theory of SL2R, you have to work with uh, infinite dimensional uh, representation because there is no, uh, I mean, unitary, there is, there is no uh, finite dimensional representation. This group is, is too complicated, it's, it, it takes too, too much place so that you can represent it unitarily, of course, in finite dimension. And uh, let me just say a few words, just a hint how to prove this problem. This, this, this is uh, easy. Uh, wh what is the ID? So this is a hint. Okay, let's see, hint. Okay, so suppose you have a finite dimensional uh, subspace if if v is generated by a finite number of vector then you take the lists take the list of those vector you take a, an orthogonal basis orthonormal basis And now suppose this finite dimensional vector space, which is invariant is not zero, then you can pick a unit vector. So you take V in V. And you will get a contradiction. So what you do is you write V as uh, so, so sorry, you, you write the image, you write the image uh, 
The, the image of V, you decompose it in the basis. Okay, so we have an orthonormal basis. So we look at the decomposition of this element in this basis. And now you apply Pythagore theorem. To this decomposition and uh, you apply the hypothesis of mixing and you see that there, there is something wrong so it, it and get a contradiction okay so if if you have mixing those guys they should go to zero and of course this guy is of norm one so there is something wrong so you see, this is easy to, to prove problem six, and you can think more about it uh, so that you have some intuition of, of, of what it means to be uh, mixing in terms of dynamical system and also in terms of uh, representation theory. Okay, so now let me go uh, with the proof. So maybe I, I recall uh what we want to prove and and some important facts so just to remind uh okay so our goal today is to prove this namely if you take sl2r you you choose any sequence which goes to infinity in sl2r so it leaves eventually any sub any compact subset in sl2r then if you compute the 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 coefficient for any representation which has no fixed vector then it has to go to zero this is our goal and uh, there are several steps and recall those groups so what we should remember is that if we have a topological group this is completely general if you choose any sequence in this topological group, then there are two subgroups which are naturally associated to the sequence. So M plus is in fact something which depends, of course, on the chosen sequence. And the same with n minus one, it depends on the choosing sequence. Each time you choose a sequence, whatever this sequence is, you can consider the associated subgroup n plus and n minus one. And we will specify those subgroup in the, in the case of SL2R, and we will also specify the sequence. But here it's completely general. It's very important to realize that because it means that all the ideas I will explain, they will apply in much more generality than just sl 2 And something I also recall uh, yesterday is the notion of weak operator topology. Okay, so if you have a sequence of, of operators in, in uh, acting uh, on a Hilbert space, they are bounded operators, so bounded linear transformation, you say that this sequence converges to an operator A in the weak operator topology. So, weak operator topology, the VOT, if chosen two vectors, any, any cho two chosen vectors, you should have this convergence at the level of sca scalar products. So, it's much weaker topology than the topology coming from, from the, the soup norm. But as you will see, this, is, this will be extremely useful to have this weaker topology at our disposal. Okay, now I explain 
some very general statement, which is quite automatic. And uh, we just have to follow step by step the points. And uh, this is the main idea of uh, this reference I gave, uh, Nerurkar, Elis Nerurkar, so they, they realize that. Okay, so you have a strongly continuous unitary representation of a topological group G on a Hilbert space H. So this is the data. Each time you have such a thing. In fact, there is not much uh, of a hypothesis, just any topological group and strongly continuous representation. Remember, strongly continuous means that well, when, whenever you, you fix a vector in, in H, for any V in H, if you consider the map which sends G to pi G of V, so it means you just push the vector V you have chosen by G, by the representation, this map is continuous. This is what is called strongly continuous. Okay, so we assume we have such a setting. Now, we take any sequence in G. And we assume that when you look at the image of this sequence in the operators, so the, the, this, this is a sequence of unitary operator because P is a unitary representation. You assume that this sequence of operator, it converts in the weak operator topology to an operator, which I call H, uh, A, sorry, A, okay. Now, the following things are true, namely, if you look at the subgroup associated to the sequence A, AI, and you, you, you take any element in this, in this subgroup, then the limit operator is, is uh, invariant when you apply the unitary operator obtained taking the part applied element n in n. So the limit is invariant under n plus. And there is a similar statement with n minus with the adjoint. Okay, so this is our first point. The limit is n plus invariant. Also, if you look at the set of fixed points under n plus, the subgroup associated to the sequence, so you take the complement of the, the orthogonal complement of the, the vector which has which are fixed by n plus, then it, 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 is, um, it, it vanishes, all those vectors, they vanishes when you apply the adjoint of the limit. And there is a similar statement with n minus one. Also, if we assume the sequence it commutes, so we assume we are in, in the group, we, we choose, for example, we choose the power of a single element, then of course they will commute. This is one example. So in this situation, the limit operator, it, it, will, it, it will commute with its adjoint. And the, the, the kernel of this operator is the same as the kernel of the adjoint. And also under the same hypothesis, if it commutes, then, and this will be our main uh, conclusion, if now this time you, you look at the points which are fixed under the subgroup generated by n plus n and minus one, you take the closure of this subgroup. So all the points which are fixed under this uh, subgroup, and you consider the, the, the orthogonal complement, then it is, it, it, it vanishes when you apply A, so it's in the kernel of A. Okay. So this will be crucial tool to prove uh, Omur theorem. I will of course explain how you use this lemma to get the proof, but first I would like to, to prove some uh, of those uh, implication in this lemma. Okay, so let's start with first point. Uh, okay, so we, we take the transformation which which is the 
identical transformation on, on this with two vectors in the space and in the subgroup N plus associated to the sequence EI. Okay, so um, we we compute we compute pi n of a, and we would like to show that this is the same as a, right? We would like to show that a is the limit is invariant under n plus. So in order to show that, it's enough to check it when you take scalar product. So we choose two vectors and we compute the scalar product. So what do we have? So here we use the fact that uh, pi is unitary. So you can uh, put the adjoint in the other side. And here, this is the definition of A, right? A is the limit. A is the limit of uh, pi of AI in the weak operator topology. This is our hypothesis. So we use this, this, this hypothesis here. And now we, uh, what do we do? Uh, um, okay, so in fact, uh, this is, uh, so this simplifies. So it means you have just pi of n, but you could, you could put pi of n on the other side because it's, uh, uh, unitary representation. So you see that this is a, an obvious fact. So you just uh, add uh, and, and subtract a, a pi of AI, right? Okay. And now you write this uh, by putting pi in, in, in evidence, like a, a factor. Okay. So uh, what do we get? Uh, so uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, pi n ai, which is the same as this guy here. And uh, we subtract pi one a v w and you get uh, the other factor here. So it means that it cancel and indeed you have equality. So this is also something uh, uh, obvious. And now this is interesting. So again, this is the definition of the limit, this first term. This is this term because of the definition of the limit. And you have the other uh, remaining term. And now we will see that the remaining term is uh, zero because Now we analyze this remain this 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 remainder. Okay. So this guy is going to be zero. Why? Okay, so uh, I, I, I take the complex uh, uh, norm of this complex number and I can say that this is less or equal. I use Cauchy Schwartz. This is Cauchy Schwartz. Okay. Uh, and then uh, because things here, uh, okay, uh, I just uh, yes, so here pi of AI is unitary. So pi of AI is unitary. So it does not change the norm when you apply pi of AI, so I can just forget it. And they, then an, I apply to B and, and I get this. And now this is very important to remember our hypothesis, namely, we know that this guys goes to the identity, right? The definition of n plus means that a i minus one n a i goes to the identity. If i goes to infinity, 
This is precisely the definition of N plus. And now when we apply something which goes to the identity to V, strong continu continuity of pi implies that this goes to uh, uh, pi A of V, which is V. So strong continuity now implies that this guy goes to zero. Okay, so we are done. And this proves this proves the first uh, the first statement, namely that this guy is invariant by n plus. Okay, let's uh, try to prove number two. So we have to apply uh, a star. So the limit, the adjoint of the limit, we have to apply to uh, 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 something which is a fixed point. It is orthogonal to a fixed point of n plus. Okay, so of course, A, this guy is, is a continuous operator. So its kernel is closed. Uh, so in order to prove that uh, we have an inclusion, in fact, it's enough to find a subspace which is dense in the set we would like to show that it's inside the kernel, right? Because then if you have an element of this orthogonal, then you know it's close to an element of D and you know that D is inside the kernel of A star and you know that A star is closed, so it's enough. Okay, so the problem is what should we choose as a subspace D? And uh, here is what we do. Uh, so we choose, uh, we choose D to be uh, the smallest subspace of H, which contains the vector. So you take any element in the vector space, in the Hilbert space, and you consider it's image under an element of n, and you subtract this guy. Okay, so all expression of this kind and, and take linear combination of those guys. So, okay. And uh, okay, we, we've just seen this. And uh, so now if you uh, take the adjoint, take the adjoint, then, then you get this. And uh, so it means that, uh, of course, if you now apply this equation to uh, the elements, the kind of element we decide to have in D, then we get zero, okay? So it proves that indeed what we choose uh, D is, is okay. It's, it's indeed a subspace, a subspace of the kernel of A star. Now, now wh why, why is it, uh, why, why is it uh, dense? Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, why is it a subspace of what we are interested in? Okay, uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, let us take an element which is fixed by N plus, and we would like to, to, to show that it's orthogonal to the elements in D. So we take an element in D and we compute the, the scalar product with this guy V, W, sorry. Okay, and we would like to show that it is zero. So we just compute. And here uh, we use the fact that it's unitary and we have this. Now, uh, the point is that uh, N is, uh, N plus is a subgroup. So this guy is, is also in N plus. And remember, we choose W in a, a, a fixed point for N plus. So this is in fact W. So this is zero. So, okay. So this is, this is right. Now, uh, why is the dense? Uh, okay. So the first thing to notice that is that if you restrict pi to N plus, then it preserves this subspace. 
Why is that? So, okay, so let us take an element which is in N plus and let us apply this guy. We apply this guy to an element which is in D, or which is a generator of D. Okay, so what do we get? Uh, of course, I can I can write things like that, and then I have the second term here. Okay, and the point is that uh, all the elements here M N are in N plus, so it's a subgroup. So this guy is in N plus. Okay, and uh, and so it means that what we have here as an expression is uh, an element. Let's say th this is a this is a new uh, double. Uh, how, how should I call this? Uh, v prime, maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is this is v prime. Okay. So we. We see the same guy here, V prime. So we are indeed uh, in in the same shape as the elements of D. Namely, we have pi of something which is in N plus, and we apply to some guy double V prime, uh, V prime, and you you subtract the V prime. So this is an element. So indeed, we've just checked that uh, pi preserve D when restricted to N plus. Now pi is unitary, so it means that the restriction also preserves the, the orthogonal. Okay, now if we take an element W which is in the orthogonal, and we take an element n in this subgroup, then this guy by definition is in v, in d, sorry, is in d by definition. And uh, we just, uh, we, 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 we know that uh, the orthogonal is preserved by uh, n plus, so this is stay in, 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 in d orthogonal also. Okay, so it, we are here in terms of D and D, so it's zero. So that uh, the orthogonal is in fact uh, made of fixed point, right? So that's what we we show that uh, if you take W in the orthogonal of D, you apply uh, pi of an element of n plus, then it doesn't change its a, its fixed point because the difference is zero. So we've we've proved this. So so it means that uh, when I take the intersection of the orthogonal with the orthogonal of the fixed point of n plus, uh, then I use this uh, inclusion, uh, and, and, and this is zero, okay? So, so this proves that, in fact, uh, the orthogonal is, is, is nothing. So in, inside, uh, inside uh, the orthogonal of the fixed point. So, so it means that D was already taking all the places. There is no orthogonal, right? In H, in, in, uh, in the fixed point, in the orthogonal of the fixed point. So it means that D is dense. Okay. So this is okay with uh, point uh, two. Now, how do you prove point three? Okay, so we have to check that the limit, it commutes with its adjoint. Okay, so for save, uh, for, in order to save place, we just uh, write the sequence of unitary elements we get uh, from the initial uh, chosen sequence AI. We, we write it uh, capital AI and we made the hypothesis that those elements 
commute. So it's not uh, very surprising that the limit should commute with them also. Yes, you have a sequence of elements with, which, which commute together and you claim that the limit commutes with any of them and also with their inverse. Okay, so we have to come back to the de definition of, of the limit. So remember that the limit has been defined in terms of the weak operator topology. So we come back to this definition. So we choose two elements, VW, and we apply uh, the scalar product. And we would like to see that indeed we can change the order of the operator. And we, if we succeed in doing that, then, then it's okay because we, we, we show that for any VW. So it means that the operators are the same. Okay, so why is it true? Uh, so this is just because AI is unitary. And here, this is the, the definition of A. And again, uh, so what do we do here? Uh, hmm. uh, here, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Uh, if I put AI, it seems to me <laughs> things are in the wrong direction. Uh, ah. Uh, AI and AJ commute, so it's fine. You think it's correct? Yeah, because you have given that it commutes, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. We know it commutes. So indeed, when you when you take it back here, you are in the wrong sense, but it commutes. Thank you, of course. So A, G, A, I, by a hypothesis, this is very important here, of course, it commutes, thank you. And now this is good because uh, we have put the A on the right uh, place. Okay, this is the limit. Okay, good. And uh, then you can also prove that the other equality holds. Now, uh, our goal was to show that uh, A commutes with its adjoint. So we do the same trick. A star A, we would like to show that it is A, A star. Okay, so we apply the limit. So the point is that if you have a, a sequence which commutes in the weak operator topology, it's, uh, it's very easy, it's just two lines to, to check that. Taking the adjoint, uh, you have also uh, convergence. And now we use the fact that it is unitary. So indeed, if I take the inverse here, this is indeed, it, it goes in, in the weak operator topology, it goes to A star. So this is the first step. Okay, so this is correct. And uh, we've seen that, so this, this is the, the, the previous step. Previous step, uh, we've seen here that uh, we can commute with the limit. So we, we do that. And uh, then this is uh, the definition of the, the adjoint. Okay, and here again, we, we know now that uh, this guy goes to the adjoint. And uh, here we come back uh, with definition of the adjoint. Okay, and we are done. So you see it's very automatic. Okay, so good. Now, uh, you know, if you compute uh, uh, the if if we if we write this equality here uh, 
with V equal W, then what you get is that the norm of V square is the norm of E star square. So those two guys are equal. So it means that uh, if you go to zero, then it's also, if a vector is sent to zero, then it, it's the same for the E star. So you see that the kernel are the same. Okay, good. Now, uh, what was four? Yes, four is the main thing. It, it, it says that if, if you take the fixed point by the subgroup generated by the, the n plus and, and, and the n minus one, take the orthogonal of the fixed point, it, it's included in the kernel. That's the main point. Okay. Uh, so we have seen that um, that that was something we we've, we've checked. I mean, I, I just checked one of the two uh, inclusion, but the other is the same in spirit. So so we have this inclusion, and we've just proved that. You you add twice the same uh, uh, you add twice the same uh, subspace so so of course you get the kernel okay so we have this now if you take the closure of the left hand side of course you still you still have the inclusion because the kernel is a closed subspace. Okay, uh, but in fact, if you look at what this guy is here, you see that it's the same because what does it mean to be orthogonal to uh, uh, the fixed point on n minus one and the fixed point of n plus? Uh, okay, so it, it, it's it's the same as saying that okay, you are. Uh, so how to say uh, so if if uh, first of all when you take an orthogonal it's always closed and then when when you take uh, maybe it's it's a it's a lemma I've uh, I've mentioned yes so th that was that was a lemma I've mentioned but anyway okay so this is correct. Okay, so we use this lemma to identify these, these two subsets. Okay, and now what does it mean that uh, uh, we, we come to what we are interested in, namely this. Uh, remember, I made some comments on strong continuity, and I said, I explained that in the case of strong continuity, this was yesterday, uh, you, you could forget the bar here. You could forget it. Okay, that's a remark I, got, I did. And, and now we use what we just said here. So we have this equality. And we know that it is inside the kernel. Yeah. 
here, you know, that is inside the kernel. So we've done the proof to the end. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me just before we 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 take a break, let me just uh, see what we get as a subgroups uh, in a special case. Namely, we choose a G to be our group SL2R, and uh, we consider the subgroups n plus and n minus one, and uh, we choose this set of matrices. Okay, and you can see in this in 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 this special case uh, when when you compute, for example, uh, the second. Uh, situation. Okay, so I have my element A, and I take an element in G. I, I, I don't know what it is, except that it's an element uh, of SL2R. And I would like uh, where it goes when T goes to infinity. So uh, here it cancel. And here it cancels also. And I would like that this guy goes to the neutral elements as T goes to infinity. And so you see that it, it implies that A is one, that T is one, and that B is zero. So in fact, uh, the matrix is of this kind, and uh, this is what is N minus one. Okay, so, this is very easy in this case, but it turns out that the same ID can be implemented on any uh, simple Lie group. You just roots, you use root spaces, and uh, you can identify those subgroups to the uh, positive unipotent and negative unipotent, and uh, 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 you have exactly the same structure. And this is related to, to, to what something which is called Motner phenomena which is a striking feature of those uh, algebraic group, uh, semi-simple groups. Okay, and uh, so uh, now I will uh, take a break. So we take a break. We will repeatedly uh, using a completely trivial lemma, but uh, I will not say when I use it. So I just uh, state it at the beginning. So it's just that if you have a, a sequence of complex numbers, and uh, you know that this sequence is bounded, okay? Now you would like to have a, a, a nice condition to say that this sequence goes to zero, it converts to zero. So a way to, to say it uh, in terms of subsequence, because that's what we will do uh, repeatedly, is to say that each time you have a subsequence of this sequence, then you can find a sub subsequence which goes to zero. And, and if, if you think about it, it's exactly the same. So saying that a, a bounded sequence of complex number goes to zero is exactly the same as saying that each time you choose a subsequence, you can choose a sub subsequence which goes to zero. Okay. Now we are ready to uh, go for the proof. So, so indeed, the first step is to, to, to apply this, this little lemma I just mentioned. So uh, we have two elements. 
in our vector space, the Hilbert space, and we consider the corresponding uh, coefficient. And the goal is to, to show that if the sequence goes to zero, to, to infinity, then, then uh, this has to be uh, zero at the limit. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, we will consider any subsequence of the, the number we are interested in here. And we have to prove that for any choice of a subsequence, there is always a sub subsequence, so T, uh, whose limit is zero. Okay. And when we do that, taking subsequence, we will gain, we can assume something more. And so I will just assume it. I go to the subsequence and I assume what we, we have gained. Okay. So one of the main points why uh, Omur theorem is true for SL2R is a very common feature uh, in, in, in the world of uh, algebraic group, namely, uh, if you have a semi-simple algebraic group, then you have a carton decomposition or a polar decomposition. So in this special case, it's very nice to uh, describe. So first you take the subgroup, which consists in uh, all rotations. So it means that uh, uh, ortho, ortho, orthogonal, ortho, orthogonal matrices. I, I should have written orth orthogonal matrices. So it means that, uh, uh, okay, you have, uh, uh, you know what it is. So it's equal to the, the, adjo the adjoint of uh, the matrix is the inverse and the determinant is one. Uh, and, and this is a real two by two matrix. Okay, so this is a compact subgroup. It's isomorphic to the circle. And uh, the other part we would like to understand, it's a semi-group because we, we choose T bigger or equal to zero. Okay, so diagonal matrices in SL2R, but uh, we, we just take the positive part. So it's not a group anymore, it's a semi-group. Okay, and Carton decomposition or polar decomposition uh, says that any any matrix in SL2R, you can write it in, in such a way. Of course, it's not unique, but almost unique, but we don't care. We, we just need the existence. So it means that if I have an, an element in SL2R, I can always find an element in, in SO2, an element in A+, plus, and another element Okay, so for any G in G, SL2R, there exist K, L, and A, such that you can write just like that. Okay. Okay, so we have our sequence of elements, GI. And so we, we choose to write it like we can do with the help of the Carton decomposition. So it means that we have element C K and A I is in A plus. And now uh, K is compact and pi is strongly continuous. So it means that uh, if we have our vector W and our vector V, we can look at the orbit under the action of the different elements in the compact group. And because it's compact, we, 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 we can assume that uh, it, it, uh, it stabilizes, right? Ki will converge up to taking a subsequence. Here we are. Uh, you can assume that the, the subsequence converge to a certain element in K. And uh, because pi is strongly continuous, then when you approach the limit element uh, in K, then the image will also converge to, to something. And we call this something W infinity, which is the limit. And you do the same with Ki prime, okay? 
Okay, so now we we work with this subsequence, but we do not mention it. So uh, we do not write the subscript in in the indices. Now, what is the difference between what we have to compute? Namely, our goal is to show that this goes to zero and the new terms that we got by taking the limits. So here you have v infinity instead of v, w infinity instead of w. Okay, so what's what's the difference of those terms? Okay, so uh, I just uh, write the definition uh, of uh, the elements. Gi is ai. K I A I uh, sorry the other way. So G I is K I A I K I prime. So I apply this here. And I put this guy on the other side because unitary. So I can take it here. So I do the same. Uh, with the uh, element here, why? Uh, okay, so what I do here, I apply uh, pi k minus one. Uh, no, what do I do? No, I just, I, I, I subtract, subtract, subtract this term and add this term and add, okay? Triangle inequality, I subtract, I add, and the other term is the other terms, okay? And okay, very good. So uh, how do we uh, take uh, uh, care of the first term? Okay, so we apply Cauchy-Schwarz, Cauchy-Schwarz to the first term and uh, what we get is uh, okay. We have the norm of W. We have the the norm of uh, v minus W W uh, minus v infinity, and there is the pi i, which is unitary. So we can forget this guy, and we are left with ki prime, so this is correct for the first term. And the second term, it's also Cauchy-Schwarz. We have, uh, yeah, the first term here with pi of i a unitary, so we get only the norm of the vector. And the second term is here, okay? So that's just Cauchy-Schwarz and the fact that the representation is unitary, okay? but what we see is that it goes to zero because these guys goes to zero and these guys goes to zero. By definition of the limit uh, V infinity and W infinity. So in fact, the difference between those two elements goes to zero. So it's very good because in fact, we've reduced the proof to a special case where we can concentrate on elements in the sequence, which goes to infinity, which are in the subgroup AI, which are in the semigroup A plus, sorry. So good. So we, we can assume that our sequence, which we had at a, pro, a priori, we had absolutely no information on the sequence, except that it has to go to infinity. And now we can assume that in fact, this sequence is made of diagonal matrices with T positive.
Okay, so we have this sequence. And here is a very uh, important step. So as, as you know, if you take the ball, the unit ball um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Banach space, usually, so uh, the, the unit ball in a Banach space is compact. Uh, if and only if the, the Banach space is finite dimensional, okay. But now here, I will take the unit ball. And I know in, in, in our case, it, it will not be finitely dimensional. So there is no change, it is compact. But still, I consider this object. And I change the topology, OK? And I put the weak operator topology. And with this new topology, the miracle is that this unit ball is compact. Okay, so this is the main point. So the closed unit ball in the banner space of bounded operator with the usual uh, uh, norm, the soup norm, uh, so defined by the operator norm in BH. So maybe I should remember what is the operator norm. But uh, so it means that uh, an element A in BH sup norm operator norm is the sup. You take all vector in the unit ball of uh, the Hilbert space and you apply A. Okay. So this. Uh, is what I consider the, the, the operator norm, and I consider the unit ball for the operator norm. And, and this is not compact in this topology, but it is compact with the weak operator topology. And I, I, give, I give you a reference, you, 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 can, you can check. Uh, I put uh, the notes uh, on the Zulip uh, uh, side, you, you can download the notes and you, you can look at this reference for this. Okay, so here we have a unitary operator. So, so by definition, we are in fact in the sphere. So we are in this ball. Okay, so we have a sequence in this ball. And if we look at this sequence with the weak topology, the weak operator topology, it means we can find a subsequence which converge. So we may assume that this sequence has a subsequence which converge in the weak operator topology. So it means that there is an operator, a bounded linear operator, which is the limit of our subsequence. And, and again, I will not uh, say more that I, I can assume I have this subsequence. Okay, so now I can assume that I have this. By the definition of the weak operator topology, I just apply this to the point uh, V infinity and W infinity we had uh, defined before. And uh, we knew that uh, it's enough to show that this goes to zero. Okay. So if we can prove that A is zero, this weak limit is zero, then we win because then we know that the sequence is zero, okay? So our goal now is to show that this weak limit is zero. Okay. Now, what I just said is that we have our sequence which goes to infinity. And uh, it, me it means, obviously, uh, if this, has to go to infinity and ti are positive, it means that the ti goes to infinity. Okay. Okay, now I have this special sequence uh, of exponential diagonal matrix, and I assume that the ti goes to infinity, and I consider the groups n plus and n minus one associated to this sequence. And remember, we just made the computation before the break. 
we know exactly what the n plus and n minus one are. It's unipotent plus or unipotent minus. Okay. Now the point is that if you consider the subgroup generated by n plus and n minus one and take the closure, you, you, you find the whole group of uh, SL2R. Yeah. Okay. So the smallest closed subgroup of G containing n plus and n minus one is SL2R itself. So you can check that. This is very interesting. So it's enough to have a upper triangular unipotent matrix and, and lower triangular matrix to generate any unimodular matrix. Okay, now, uh, in the hypothesis, in the theorem, of, of course, we assume that there is no, no non-trivial fixed point. Okay, and now, uh, this is one thing we should, of course, remember. Now, on the other end, we have all the hypotheses to apply our lemma about the commute, the, the, the limit of a sequence of elements which commutes. So recall, we have those commutation. And uh, of course, here, uh, uh, this is the case because we have reduced our sequence here to element in A plus. And of course, A plus is commutative. It's a diagonal matrices. Uh, in fact, they are all, it's a one parameter subgroup. So of course they commute. Okay, so we have the lemma, uh, which is valid. We can apply it. Now, uh, remember the lemma said this. This is the lemma. Okay, but as I just said, that G is generated by unipotent matrices, plus and minus one. So we have this. And now there is no, uh, there is no fixed point. So it means that this is the hypothesis of the theorem, no fixed point. Of course, if there is a fixed point, we, we, we can't have something which is mix, mixing, of course. No fixed point. This is the hypothesis. And so it means we have the orthogonal of zero, but this is, this is H, right? Okay, so what we just proved is that the kernel of A is the whole space. In other words, A is zero. Okay, so A is zero, it proves the theorem because remember we have this is zero. Okay, uh, so I should say that this uh, proof is much more uh, elementary and easy to follow than the original proof of uh, um, uh, O and Moore. And uh, as I said, this is, this is due to uh, Ellis and uh, Nehrurkart. So I get the reference again in the notes. Okay. So uh, now I would like to uh, uh, go, uh, go on with the, with the third uh, subject I would like to explain in, in these lectures. Uh, so uh, when you have uh, an ergodic transformation, uh, according to either Weil or von Neumann or Birkhoff, you, you know that you can compare uh, the average of a function and, uh, uh, and it's, so you, 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 you take an orbit and you take uh, a, a function and you take the average of this function on the orbit and you compare it with the integral of the function. That's, that was a common point in, in all those statements. 
from the, the first lecture. And, and now we would like to, to analyze that in, in a more uh, uh, quantitative way. Namely, we would like to, to say something about rates of convergence. Okay. So, so you know, you know it converges, but does it converge uh, fast or not? And uh, here is a, a way of formulating these questions. Uh, so it uses something which is called, called the discrepancy. So let me explain what is the discrepancy. Okay. So, so the context is as usual. So you have a, a probability space and you have a group. But this time, the group a priori, it's a, it's a discrete group. It's a finitely generated group or, or, or not. But, but there is no topology a, a priori. It's just a, uh, an abstract group here. So that's why I call it gamma rather than, than G. Or it, it could also be G, but here I just choose that uh, it's, it's a, mainly a finitely generated group, like a, a free group or a surface group or whatever. Okay, so it acts on X and we assume here that the, the measure is preserved. Okay. And I choose a finite symmetric family of elements of gamma. So it means nothing more than I pick a finite element of gamma and each time I pick an element, I always pick the inverse of this element. I can repeat uh, several times the same element. It's a family, it's not a subset. Okay. But it's very important. Each time you pick an element, you also pick the inverse. Okay. So you do this. And now you will associate a number which will be very relevant from a dynamical point of view, but also from an operator point of view, which is called the discrepancy associated to the action and this family, okay? So it's not enough to have just a group acting, you also have to pick a family. So you pick a family, a symmetric family, and then you define this number. So what is this number is, you look at a function, which is L2, uh, such that uh, its L2 norm is, is one, and you take the integral, and for each point, for each point X in your space, you compare the integral with the average over the symmetric family. So you, you apply your, your chosen function on, on this uh, family, on this uh, symmetric family, and you take the average, and you do it for, for, each, for each x, okay? So it, it gives you for each x a comparison between two numbers. One is always the same. It's the integral of the function f, and the other depends on the choice of x, because of course, it's an, another orbit under the action of the family. Now, uh, you consider this as a function of X, maybe sometimes sometime it's small, sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's even not defined by, because the function F is in L2. So you have to choose a representative for it. So up to a, a, a subset of a zero measure, it's not well defined, but as a whole, as an L2 function, this is well defined. So this L2 function, you take the L2 norm. Okay. So in fact, this is the L2 average of the difference between the integral of the function and the average on the orbit defined by the family um, of the function f. And now you take the worst case, namely what you expect is that in fact, there is a discrepancy between the integral, which is something continuous and this process of choosing orbit, which is a finite discrete process. 
you, you expect, of course, that there is a difference, but you expect this difference to be small. So you take the worst case, namely, among all functions of norm one, you are interested in the one where this discrepancy is, is the maximal one. It's a supremum, of course, and that's the discrepancy. Okay, so we will see that, in fact, this discrepancy is always bounded above by one. This is not difficult. I will explain why it is true. And what is very interesting is that sometimes you get something which is smaller than one. And in, in, in general, this is not easy to prove that you have such a situation. But if you can prove it, then it's a very strong st statement. And in fact, it's called strong ergodicity uh, in, uh, in the reference 10. So you can have a look in this very interesting reference um, uh, about uh, this question. And uh, in particular, of course, uh, it implies ergodicity of the action. So if you have just one family with uh, smaller discrepancy than one, strictly smaller, then it means that the action of gamma is ergodic. I will explain this also. And uh, there are examples of finitely generated free groups which acts by isometry on the sphere. So in fact, if you pick element in SO3R, so you know this, this Lie group, this is a three-dimensional Lie group. It's the, the, the part of uh, uh, orientation preserving uh, isometry of uh, Euclidean space. It's a nice compact group. Uh, so if you pick elements in random in this, um, in this group, so you have uh, axis of rotation, as you know, and uh, you pick randomly those axes of rotation, and you pick randomly an angle, and usually they will generate a, a free group, right? There is no relation because you pick things in random. And the question is, what about the discrepancy uh, if, you, if you do that? Huh? So, the, so there is a an action, of course, uh, on the sphere because it's a uh, isometry, so it acts on the sphere. So if if you have a, a free group uh, of uh, rank n, let's say, uh, or rank r, you can you can choose many free groups here, and you you can look at how they act on the sphere, and you can play this game. And it was proved that you can compute uh, the discrepancy in, in some family of subgroup, which are very special, uh, which are defined in terms of very subtle arithmetic construction. And this has been uh, constructed with the smallest possible discrepancies. And this are uh, uh, construction due to uh, Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak. And uh, Phillips is uh, some, some guy from uh, from uh, interest, interested also in, in uh, applied math. And the problem is related to the question of having a, a two sphere. And, and it, it, it seems obvious, but, but it is not. So how do you do to, to distribute uh, points on the sphere? You have a, a bunch of points you want to put on the sphere, but you would like to to do it regularly. So you, you, you don't want to lose points. You, you want to uniformly fill in the two sphere with, let's say, uh, billiards of points. You, you, you have a finite number, but very huge. How, do you, how do, you, do you distribute your point on the sphere? And that's, that's not at all obvious. Because if you, if you begin with a pattern, so you, you, you can imagine a pattern, but this pattern will be not homogeneous because if you imagine a pattern like uh, following uh, meridian or, or longitude, 
then that then something at the pole will, will appear which is not homogeneous so you say okay i should not do that so do do this in another way but in fact there is no way there is no no obvious way to to do that and one solution to this problem is to to find those subgroup and and to to follow the distribution given by the orbit of points okay so there is some relation with applied math here so that's what i say is that uh, they are used to construct large finite configuration of points on the sphere which are optimally equidistributed oh, okay so what mean optimally equidistributed this is very difficult to 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 to, to be to, to agree on that but one way is to say that this discrepancy is small and what i hope i will uh, at least mentioned is that there is a very interesting uh, connection with a uh, function defined by Harish Chandra. Uh, and you can exactly compute those discrepancies in some cases. So it gives, uh, it, it gives exact convergence rate for families of points on the sphere, for example. And uh, here I follow a paper with uh, Antoine uh, Pinochet Lobos, which uh, is uh, recently published on uh, uh, so l'enseignement mathématique. So uh, I, I get the reference in the notes. Okay. So uh, let me explain the basic tools to uh, understand this uh, famous discrepancy. So how do we uh, do computation with this? So the main idea is to uh, find a way to compute this in terms of the norm of an operator, which is related to Koopman representation. So I review some uh, background on uh, representation theory. So if you have any group, uh, then you, you, you can try to make it linear. So that's the idea of uh, the group algebra, which is simply defined as all finite formal combination of element of the group. And you put some coefficient here, which are complex coefficient. This guy is just a complex number, okay? So you just put, for example, you, you, you say, okay, I put, twice the neutral element plus, I don't know, I have a certain element, uh, I put it uh, uh, i times uh, gamma, this element, so i is uh, in C, and so on, and you can do anything. And uh, for example, uh, we'll see if we have a, a, a generator, uh, a group generated by two elements, plus or minus one, I can just consider those two guys here as special elements and uh, I consider half one this is the positive generator plus uh, the negative generator okay so there are elements in the group they are in the group gamma and here this is uh, an element uh, C. Okay, so formal combination of elements of gamma. And this is a group algebra because uh, you can add formal combination, they are finite, and you can multiply. And you multiply when you see elements of the groups, then you multiply according to the group law. And when you see elements from the complex uh, uh, field, then, then you multiply them as complex number. And you can associate a norm. Namely, you just take uh, the norm of the complex number, you look at uh, all the coefficients, and you add the complex, the, the norm. And uh, you, all, you can also consider L1 on, on gamma. So you consider uh, functions which are uh, bounded in, in L1 norm. And there is a, a law, which is the convolution law. Right. So here is the law. So you can see f as 
a sort of density. And then uh, it acts uh, on G as the left regular representation. And you take the mean. And okay, so it means that you have two uh, algebra structures, one on C gamma, and you have one in L uh, or, or L1 gamma. And uh, if you have any representation, yeah, so sorry, so you, you can embed, you, you can embed C gamma, you can embed it in L1 gamma, just send the element gamma to the characteristic function of gamma, which is zero if uh, gamma is not uh, the chosen gamma. Okay, characteristic function of the point. So this is an embedding uh, of algebra. And now if you have a unitary representation, then you can extend it uh, to uh, uh, a representation of algebra. So how do you do? So in one size, you extend it uh, to uh, uh, the group algebra. And on the other side, you extend it to uh, the algebra of a bounded operator. And here, this is the right regular representation. Okay. Now I can reformulate what is the discrepancy in terms of operators. So. So suppose uh, I consider the Hilbert space, uh, which is as usual associated to uh, our probability space. So we have this probability space and take, take L2 of this probability space, take the, the function, uh, which is the characteristic function of X as we did. And remember, we take the projection onto this characteristic function. And this projection is an orthogonal projector by definition, that's what we choose. And here, remember that um, um, the, <clears throat> the Koopman representation, I, I should have uh, written here, that uh, the, the, the Koopman representation uh, here, Oh. Sorry, the Koopman representation, I would like to put it in red because I forget to say that it's the Koopman. Okay. Uh, the Koopman representation, remember, it preserves the decomposition of uh, L2 into uh, So the function such that the integral is zero and the constant function. So because it preserves this decomposition, when you apply P, P uh, is just a projection onto the second factor. So it means that uh, when you first project and then you apply pi, it doesn't change anything because the action here uh, preserves the measure. So, uh, so I should say uh, that uh, here, uh, gamma uh, preserves mu. So it means we have this Koopman representation and uh, it, uh, it, uh, it fixes the, the constant function. Okay, so when, when you first project and then you apply pi, it's the same as first applying p, which preserves the component, and then take the, the, the constant component, right? So in fact, it commutes. 
it commutes and, and it's equal to P, right? Okay, now, as before, I, I consider the restriction of uh, the Kutman representation to L, L0, so the kernel of P. And now we can see that, in fact, the thing we are interested in is a operator norm. So my goal is to show this. Namely, we have an interpretation of the discrepancy in terms of the operator norm of something. So, so how do we achieve that? So first, we take an element in the group algebra. Okay, so as an example, you take example. Suppose gamma is finitely generated by a finite symmetric set. And uh, then what you do is uh, here you consider it as a subset. So it's a family, it's a special family, it's a, just a subset. And uh, okay, you, you still have to put the inverse. And uh, what you do is you choose new to be uh, sum over S and nu of gamma is one over S. And then uh, you put uh, each element S and maybe you put also the inverse. And so you, you put S plus the inverse. Yes. Okay, so that, that's uh, an example. Okay, so what is important is that those elements here, they sum up to one. That's what I assume. A priori, they are element of C, but you can choose very special case where they are real and you, you want that the sum is one. Okay, so take such an element and now you push this element by the representation by zero, which is the Koopman representation. And so this is an operator associated to uh, this element, right? So it's just the linear combination of the action of uh, gamma uh, defined by the Koopman representation. And you consider the operator norm of this uh, transformation. And you see the, the condition that the sum is one implies that you have the following uh, identity. In fact, uh, because we've seen that uh, if uh, we project things, uh, you can apply gamma, it doesn't change it. So I could say that this guy is here. I could, sh I could put, uh, P of new, I could put P of new, uh, apply it to P, it doesn't change it. So it's equal because, because of this, uh, because of this fact. Okay. And what is interesting here is that I have the identity minus P. But if you, uh, you draw a little uh, picture, okay, so you have H, you have C times one, and you have L zero to of X mu. And we know we have a decomposition. And now what is, if we take a function, a vector here, then we can first project it. This is P of this vector. Now you can take minus this guy. 
and you can add it to the vector. And when you add it, this is a Euclidean geometry in infinite dimensional, but never mind, we, we, we work in a two dimensional plane. What you get is, of course, the projection of phi into uh, onto L, L0, right? So, in fact, here, what we get. orthogonal okay so here we we have this orthogonal projection so this is very interesting because when you want to compute the the norm of this operator here. Okay, we want to compute the, the norm of this. This is the discrepancy. Uh, you can say, okay, but what do I see here? So in fact, I see this operator, right? This is the same. So if you take this operator and you apply it to F, you will get this. This is the same. But now you can decompose this operator in two steps. You can see, well, this is first orthogonal projection onto L0, and then applying this guy. But so it means that if you take a, a sphere in the Hilbert space, you take a sphere, take a sphere of of radius one in the Hilbert space, and you want to compute the soup to compute the operator norm. And in fact, it's the same as computing the image of the sphere when you project it on uh, L02. So it means that in fact, computing the soup on the sphere, which is the green sphere, it is the same as computing the soup projected here because of the very special form of the operator we are looking. It's just the composition of this projection here plus this operator. So the conclusion is that indeed we have this equality. Of course, what I explain is uh, quite uh, geometric and uh, you, you may uh, do it completely formal and algebraic but i wanted to convey the idea and uh, this is the main point is that now we have a tool to evaluate this discrepancy which is uh, relevant for uh, from the point of view of dynamical system in purely operator terms and this will be very helpful because we have uh, uh, the power of uh, functional analysis to help us uh, to compute those, those norms. And uh, here I, I, I just repeat, I would like to finish with this. I, I simply repeat this example here. Yeah, maybe it's more clear, clearly written here. So that's an example, typical example of what I want to say. So uh, we choose a finite family of elements and we, we pick the element the inverse and we normalize by the number which is twice the element in the family because uh, we always they always come in pairs. Okay, so if if you choose uh, this guy, in fact, uh, what you, what you recover is exactly the discrepancy. Of the family. Okay, so thank you for your attention.